Lord, everyone. Good to be in this wonderful atmosphere and to feel what we feel in our hearts. I appreciated the service last night. This camp meeting may not be doing a whole lot for you. It's doing a whole lot for me. I'm hearing things preached that I, I appreciate from the bottom of my heart. I cut my teeth on preaching like we heard last night. And if young preachers really want to get a hold of something, they need to take hold of that message that was preached last night. I don't think a preacher can ever make it without having a spirit of intercession in his heart. Ever so often, it's, it's got to be there. And I, I look back and I, I really don't know why I ever wanted to be a preacher. I never saw anything glamorous about it. I never saw anything beautiful about it, anything that was really decorated up. All I ever saw was sacrifice, hardship, heartache, disappointment. I uh, was reared on the evangelistic field. My dad built 15 churches, baptized upward to 10,000 people in Jesus' name, had a great ministry, <clears throat> but we traveled all the time all the time, going from one place to another, preaching the gospel, opening new churches. In those days there were no, uh, there was no support at all. Man just had to go in with raw faith, believe that God had called him, and go in and pitch his tent, or have an open air meeting, or a brush arbor, or a schoolhouse, or an old storefront building and start preaching and praying without any help at all, trusting God. And uh, I've sat on the platform when I was a kid. I used to play the banjo, and, and my feet wouldn't even touch the floor. And I'd see that old dad of mine take the last dollar out of his pocket to give to the work of God, and, and I'd just uh, hide my head behind that big old head of that banjo, and I'd just... Uh, cry my heart out. I'd think, well, now why does it have to be this way? There was a lot of things that I wanted, and there was a lot of things I felt like the family needed. And I, I'd i sit there and weep when I'd see him give his last dollar, and so much of the time going down the highway to preach, not enough money to get to the next place, just going on faith somehow God always made a way. But I look at all the sacrifice and the heartache and the turmoil and, and disappointment, and uh, through it all, there was that hunger in my heart to preach the gospel. I don't know why. I never saw anything glamorous about it. But the call was there, and you can't get away from the call of God. And I appreciate my call. I thank God for what he's done for me. I felt greatly humbled last night after the service. <clears throat> and uh, I thought about it the first thing when I woke up this morning. I was so happy to see Brother and Sister Hattaball, our good missionaries. And uh, when he shook my hand, and he told me how disappointed and let down he felt when he landed here in this country and his first few days was in the States. He felt so depressed when he saw the materialism in uh, the United States. And uh, people are working and making good money and buying bigger homes and greater automobiles. And I, I, thought, I thought of my own lifestyle. I, I, never, I didn't know what, a, what it was to sleep in a bed till I was about 13 or 14 years old. I thought all preacher's kids slept on pallets or on a bench or in a car seat. And really, that's just about the way it was. And I thought how far I have come, 
how much God has blessed me. I'm enjoying pastoring a wonderful church, one of the most wonderful group of people in the world. They love me. They give us everything we want. They provide a beautiful home for us to stay in. And uh, they buy us a new car to drive. I, I tried to slip around this year to buy one before anniversary time because I knew they were going to get it. I thought, well, if I can go ahead and get it. They found out about it, and the men came to me, and they said, Brother Kilgore, we're going to feel hurt, very disappointed, if you don't let us buy you a new car. That this is the one thing we can do for you. You do so much for us. This is the one thing we can do for you that we enjoy doing. Please don't take that joy away from us. They went down and made arrangements two weeks ago for me to get a brand new car. I felt greatly humbled last night. When our missionary said what he did. I, I don't want the spirit of Laodicea to grip my heart. I don't want to feel like we're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. The truth of the matter is we need a whole lot of things. We need a lot of love. And we need a lot of concern. We need a lot of compassion. You'll have to forgive me. I, maybe it's conviction that I feel. But I want the spirit of sacrifice, and I have preached it to my church. Our church knows what it is. Our church gave something like $60,000 last year to foreign missions alone, all together. They gave something like $40,000 to home missions all together. And I have tried to preach it. But I, I still feel that there is a spirit of sacrifice that has got to grip our hearts before the coming of the Lord. I felt it when I woke up this morning. Oh, God, help us to be willing when we hear preaching like we heard last night to humble our hearts. Amen. God, help us. I know at the conference Salt Lake City, I believe, was one of the greatest conferences that I was ever in in my life, and I saw what happened on Missionary Day there. We sat there, we were spellbound. I have never been in a service, I don't believe, in all of my life like that. It seemed like that the spirit of sacrifice gripped that conference. One man that had a farm that was worth sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 went home and sold it and gave it to missions. You heard the folks, different ones, as they stood to their feet. They were willing to give their homes, sell their homes, sell their automobiles. They, they just felt that spirit grip their hearts. It seemed to me like that we almost reached a turning point in our movement where we were really headed the right direction. God honored it. I don't want us to lose that. I pray that God would revive it in our hearts again and again and again. And I know that many of you fine ministers here have made many sacrifices and are still making sacrifices. I know that you are, and I know what, that you know what I'm talking about. But I pray that even though my church blesses me and is so good to me, that I would not forget I would not forget. I would not forget those days of traveling and traveling all night because we didn't have money to stop. 
No such thing as going into a restaurant to eat. There was no money. Maybe a dollar or two to stop and buy lunch meat and bread and spread a cloth out to the side of the road and move benches back in the church house and make beds there. Right there in that city where I pastor, my dad went in there <clears throat> about 38, 40 years ago, I guess it was, and preached a meeting in an old, uh, they moved us into an old storefront building. My mother strung up curtains and quilts to petition off rooms. She was a champion at making the best of every situation and uh, made our beds there, no fans, no air conditioning. Never thought about it being a hardship. Little did I realize that a few years later, or many years later, I would be in that same city pastoring and people would love me and take care of every desire it seemed that I would have. But I don't want to forget those days. I don't want to forget those hard benches that I slept on when I was a kid. I, I, I love this gospel. Praise God. Forgive me, folks. I just... Amen. Let's never forget what God has done for us. God has been good to all of us. Do you appreciate what he's done for you? Praise God. Let us worship him a little bit. Bless his wonderful name. Oh God, help us, Lord. I pray your blessings on this great camp, Lord. Bless the precious saints of God that have gathered here and have given and given to support this camp and the work of God. Bless these ministers of the gospel who have pushed and pulled and preached and prayed. And I pray that somehow this morning that I could feel that touch from God, the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Help me to teach or to preach. Help me to say something, Lord. Oh, God, we need you today. We need you this morning. We need the touch of God. Would you meet every need that is here? Somehow, through the word of the Lord, touch every heart and meet every need. Draw us closer to you. Help us to be humble. We've got a long ways to go to be like you, Lord. And I want to give the way you want me to give. And I want to live the way you want me to live. Help us to do that, Lord. Help us today, I pray. Touch every heart that is here. You know the individual needs. You know the deep burdened hearts that came to this camp meeting, hungry for something. You know the preachers that have come here seeking the will of God for their lives. They would like to hear that still, small voice speaking to them and showing them what to do and giving them a new direction. I know that the Holy Ghost can do a work right here today and in the rest of this camp. And I pray that the glory cloud of your presence would rest over this area and the glory of God would sweep through the length and breadth of this tabernacle. I pray that hungry hearts would be satisfied and I pray that those minds that are confused all of a sudden they'd have a clear mind and they would know what the will and purposes of God for their lives are. Continue to bless this district I pray the Holy Ghost to move in this district, in every church, in every heart, every leader, every board member, every pastor. Oh, God, let there be a sweeping move of your spirit throughout this great district. We may not have another camp meeting. We feel that your coming is near. 
If this would be the last time we'd be privileged to gather here at a meeting, help us to drink in as much as we can, Lord, and help us to be prepared. Find something here that would help us to be prepared for your coming. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I don't even know if I can preach this morning. I feel a stir in my heart. God help us. God help us. Would you stand? I know I've already taken a little time here, and I, I trust you'll forgive me for that. Praise God. I know, I know that this church has been brought to us as a result of sacrifice. And I know that uh, those old timers preached the word of God straight to us. We're here as a result of that. But I'm going to try to get into my lesson this morning. And if I go over a few minutes, would it be all right? First Corinthians chapter 15. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory, by which also ye are saved, if. I want you to notice the little word if throughout the New Testament. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. You may be seated. We are saved and sanctified and satisfied by the truth of God's Word. I think in these <clears throat> few short verses, the Apostle Paul gives a pretty good definition of what the gospel is. He says it is the death, and it is the burial, and it is the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, we all know and believe that Death is typified by repentance. We repent of our sins. By so doing, we're dying. There has to be a death before there can be a life. And so by death, we repent. And uh, we have to be buried when we die and we go down in the water. According to Romans, the sixth chapter, we are buried with him in baptism. And it must be by immersion and it must be done the proper way, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then there has to be a resurrection. That's the Holy Spirit baptism with the initial sign and miracle evidence of speaking with other tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance. Now, there are a lot of folks that are talking in tongues today, and they greet one another by asking, have you spoken today? And in teaching folks to receive the Holy Ghost, they teach them words to say. And uh, they teach them how to talk in tongues. I would have to tell you that talking in tongues is not the evidence of the Holy Ghost. I shocked you with that, didn't I? But speaking with other tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance. 
That's the evidence of the Holy Ghost. Praise God. I'm glad I didn't leave you folks back there. You'd say Brother Kilgore came up here and preached false doctrine. But on the day of Pentecost, they began to speak as the Spirit gave utterance. They were not taught how to speak. They were not given words to say. But the Spirit of God began to move within them, forcing the words out. And they spoke in other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. Now that's the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. We are saved by the gospel. Jesus stood before Pilate some 2,000 years ago. Pilate asked the question that has been asked hundreds and thousands of times since then. What is truth? Did you ever wonder why Jesus did not answer? He made no attempt to answer. He stood there. The fact of the matter is Pilate was looking at truth and he did not recognize it. There he stood. The gospel is embodied in the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of that one who stood before Pilate. That's truth. The law came by Moses, the Bible tells us, but grace and truth came, how? By Jesus Christ. I want you to look at first, uh, or Second John, I believe it is, verses 1 and 2. The elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth. For the truth's sake, for the truth's sake, which dwelleth in us and shall be with us, how long? Forever. Truth will be with us forever. Truth is defined as fact, as reality, as finality. Truth is unchangeable. You cannot alter truth. Truth is a fact. You can kick a fact around and push it out of the way, but when you come back, it's going to be there. It's a fact. It's truth. And so the message that we preach is truth. Thank God for it. The message of repentance, water baptism in Jesus' name, then filling of the Holy Ghost, that's the message of truth. We'd better never compromise that truth. Brother Richard pointed out last night, Isaiah 59, that truth had fallen in the streets. Men had pushed it down. And I feel that truth must be settled once and for all in our hearts and in our lives so that there would never be any spirit of compromise there. Truth has stood the test of time. Truth has stood the test of fire, of water. Truth has stood the test of the ages. Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 12. Very important passage of Scripture. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there would be, there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Taking the beautiful gospel of Christ and perverting it to suit their own fancy. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Am I here to convince certain persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. We are preaching a certified gospel. It has the stamp and the seal and the approval of God upon it. And so that makes it important. We are saved by this gospel. Romans 1, 16, Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation. You quit preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, 
you're, you will automatically quit preaching the power of God and the salvation. So this power of the gospel certainly had the power to transform lives. That happened on the day of Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they're all in one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind filled all the house where they were sitting. There appeared in them cloven tongues like as a fire set upon each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. This did not just happen in a corner. Somebody said uh, they believed that uh, Pentecost just happened. It didn't happen. It was divinely planned in the heart and mind of God. It was prophesied in the Old Testament. It was typified in the Old Testament, prophesied in Isaiah and in Jeremiah both, and also the book of Joel. It was typified in the Old Testament, typified in the tabernacle plan. It was typified by 120 priests who stood at the altar, the dedication of the Temple of Solomon, with silver trumpets in their hands. It's not by accident that the number was 120. Here it is typified way back there. Not only typified and prophesied, but it was promised by none other but the Lord Jesus himself. He said, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And then it was fulfilled. And then it uh, was taught in the epistles as one of the cardinal doctrines of the church. And it has continued through the centuries. So this truth that we preach, the message that we preach, was preached on the day of Pentecost, not by accident, but the divine foreknowledge and planning of Almighty God. Philip preached the same gospel when he went to Samaria. Peter preached the same gospel in Acts chapter 10. Paul preached the same gospel in Acts 19. I'm not telling you anything new, but it's good to go over the basics once in a while. It's good to go over the fundamentals. Amen. Rehearse it again. Teach it to your children when you sit down. When you're eating at the table, when you're riding along, praise God. I've made my boy memorize scriptures every day on this trip. I'd say, son, get the Bible and read to us. We would get the reading. I'd say, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach you some scriptures. I, I just feel the urgency to do that. And we need to do it. Rehearse these things over and over and over again. Because they are important truths. The reason we are here today, somebody preached the gospel. The gospel. The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And uh, I can remember those early days of Pentecost, those early days in my life. Maybe it was not so early in Pentecost, but great revivals. There was nothing for my dad to have meetings where 75, 100, 150 get the Holy Ghost, one meeting right after another. Great move of God. And people were receiving the Holy Ghost, entire churches. I went back last year to dedicate a little church a new church in Moark, Arkansas, and my dad built the first church there. He really didn't build the first church. He went in there, he and my mother, and before they started their meeting, they went on a 30-day uh, prayer chain, 30 days of prayer. They prayed uh, day and night. They said from 16 to 18 hours a day, praying for God to move in that community. And uh, when he finally started the meeting, they said that he stepped in that pulpit and his face shone with the glory of God. Ten men began to fall in their seats, repenting. And uh, there was a great revival. The entire Methodist church was baptized in Jesus' name, including the pastor. He didn't really build the first church. He just took the sign off of the front of it. First Methodist Church and put Pentecostal Church there because the pastor and all the members received the Holy Ghost. Uh, it became as a result of prayer and travail that Brother Urshan preached about and the preaching of the gospel. Amen. 
I can tell you about an experience where an entire Presbyterian church in northeast Missouri, southeast Missouri, where they received the Holy Ghost. And uh, great miracles took place. It was a result of the preaching of the gospel. In the meeting that I received the Holy Ghost in, it was a brush arbor meeting. You folks know what a brush arbor is. That's where they put up poles and put the poles across the top and put uh, foliage on top, uh, limbs and leaves, and they put so much on those old brush arbors that if it would rain, it'd take sometimes uh, three or four hours for the water to seep through. That's where I got the Holy Ghost. In a little community called Hennepin, Oklahoma, people came by the hundreds for that revival. What a great revival. Ninety-six brand new people received the Holy Ghost. There were 80-some people to be baptized in Jesus' name. And on a Sunday afternoon, they were lined up in a great, around a great big high bank, around a large pool. My dad stood there in the hot sun for about an hour and a half, firing away, preaching the gospel. And he's, this was the first Jesus' name baptismal service in that community. And people had come from all over the country to see what it was all about. Finally, when he got through preaching, he said, Now, all you folks that had planned to get baptized today, I want you to line up. Eighty-some people lined up. He said, Now, all of you folks who have not come prepared to be baptized, but you have been convicted by the preaching of the word, the gospel today, I want you to come into the water with these. They begin to come down off of that big high bank in their good clothes, many of them knowing they would drive for maybe 10 or 15 miles to get home. But here they came, ladies in their good clothes, men in their good suits. And uh, when they counted them, there was, there was 120 that was to be baptized in Jesus' name. And the glory of God fell in that place, on that, that old pool that day. Finally, my dad saw that time was running out. And he wasn't getting anywhere because people were being so blessed of the Lord. And he called back for Brother Charlie Carter. He said, Brother Carter, if you don't come help me, we never will get through. Those men stood back to back in that pool, baptizing as fast as they could. My brother or my sister, upon the confession of your faith and obedience to the words of our Lord and Master, I now baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah! How God fell, people fell out on the water under the power of God, floated around there. Now don't try that unless you're under the power or you know how to float because you'll sink. But they were. They were floating all around there. The only way that Dad could baptize them was when they'd float by or he'd have to walk over to them and take them under in Jesus' name. Praise God. That was the result of the preaching of the gospel. You would not have a camp meeting today had you not had those old timers years ago that preached the gospel to you. Not only are we saved by the gospel, we are sanctified. Some folks are afraid of that word. We don't use it like some folks do, saved and then sanctified and and uh, then filled with the Holy Ghost. We don't believe it as a second definite work of grace, but we do believe in sanctification. That's what holiness is all about. Holiness does the work of sanctification in our lives. People who don't love holiness don't love sanctification. They, uh, people who don't love holiness, first thing you know, they believe that grace covers it all. And they believe that once you're saved, always saved. But sanctification does a definite work in your heart and life. The holiness is one of the moral attributes of God. It's the communicable attribute. God says, be ye holy, for I am holy. And he puts his holiness within us. First of all, it's the Holy Ghost. And then the word of God is preached. And holiness does a work in that word, a work, a work of purifying and sanctification that goes on in our lives. Don't be afraid of the word sanctification. We're sanctified by the truth of God's word. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 tells us because they receive not the love for the truth 
You know, you can be saved by the truth and later on not feel like, you know, feel like that it's not important and not really love it. There are a lot of folks who have truth and who believe truth, but they don't really love it like they should. I feel like when you love truth, you're willing to die for it. Praise God. You'll stand alone for it. And uh, because they receive not the love for the truth, God said that he's going to give them a final testing. And if they don't love it, he's going to send a strong delusion. They will believe a lie and be damned because they receive not the love for the truth. And so it's one thing to have truth, it's another thing to love it. Be convinced, this is it, I must stand for truth. So I'm sanctified by it. Now let me turn again to 1 Peter, the first chapter, verses 22 and 23. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth, through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Do you folks believe that scripture? Sure you do. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth. You were the servants of sin, Paul tells us in Romans, but you have obeyed that form of doctrine that was left unto you. You have obeyed that form of doctrine, and you are purifying your souls in obeying the truth. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. The word of God becomes a seed. The word is preached. The Holy Ghost takes the word and moves in the womb of the church. And that seed is conceived in the church. Bible said when Zion prevails, then sons and daughters will be born into the kingdom of God. Galatians 4, 26, Paul says, But Jerusalem, which is free, is the mother of us all. So when the word is preached, thank God, God takes that word, that precious seed, and it's planted in the womb of the church by the Holy Ghost. The Spirit of God moves upon it, and then it produces, as Zion travails, children, sons and daughters are born into the kingdom of God. This shows the importance of the Word. It also shows the importance of the church, and how important that church is in the sight of God. When the Word is preached, it must fall into hearts that are humble and sincere and obedient and prayerful. You take prayer out of Pentecost, you're going to have a, dry, a, a dry, dead, formal religion. We must continue with prayer. Prayer has made us what we are. I can remember those camp meetings when I was a boy. I would be awakened in the morning. The men all stayed inside of the tent and the ladies all stayed inside of the church house. And uh, there was no, uh, no motels in those days. Nobody had money and no cabins. And uh, the men all stayed in one place and the ladies another. And early every morning, I can remember those, some of those old preachers praying. And one man especially, he prayed in sort of a monotone voice. Never changed his voice. It was sort of at a high pitch, praying for God's blessing upon the church and the camp meeting. And I'd turn over and I'd put the pillar over my ears and I'd try to go to sleep. But that voice kept penetrating. Amen. There was something about it. When the word was preached, the seed would fall in the church. The Holy Ghost would move upon it. That spirit of prayer and travail would begin to cause sons and daughters to be born into the kingdom of God. Now then... If that be true, I want to show you something else that can happen. If a compromising gospel is preached, that seed is going to fall somewhere also. It's going to be conceived and children will be born of that. What kind of children will be born through a compromised gospel? My Bible tells me the sons of God made the daughters of men. And giants were born. A monstrosity appears. 
something that is uh, abnormal, something that is unusual. That's why Paul said, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Why? For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? Remember and hear me, if you will. Some kind of birth takes place, and some kind of children are born into that church. It is a type of child that will not be obedient to the Word of God. There are some folks that are born under the spirit of rock and roll music. What kind of a Christian will they make? What kind of a saint will they make? There are some that are born in a spirit of lightheartedness where a shout is produced and shout and uh, worship is promoted instead of the real pure power of God. Now what kind of children are born? You say, what are you getting at, Brother Kilgore? I want to show you something here. I hope the Lord will help me for the next few minutes. I heard an old, old missionary of the Assemblies of God many years ago. I happened to be in a place and he was speaking and I stepped into the meeting and he stood there with tears in his eyes. He had been a missionary in India for many years. He said, I don't know what's happened to our church since I have come back. He said, I have seen worldliness that I didn't see when I left. He said, I've seen standards torn down that we used to hold dear. He said, what has happened to my church? He said, uh, I know that some of you preachers a few years ago promoted the movie The Cross and the Switchblade and you told your members it was all right to go to the theater to see it. But he said, when you let them go to the theater to see that, you could not close the door. They went back to see what else was on. And he said, once you opened the door, there was no closing it. He said, what has happened to my church? Amen. You preach a compromising gospel, people come in in a worldly atmosphere. If it's come through the beat of a rock and a roll music, there's something within me that rebels against that. It repels me. My, my spirit does not harmonize with it. I try to find myself keeping up with it, but there's no way you can do it. And some folks seem to think you've got to get a rock and roll band to get out there to relate to those you know that are in the world. And that's the only way you can win them. After you win them, what have you got? How long will they stay? What do they live by? What have you got to continue to feed them? Thank you. The Lord quickened the scripture to my heart as I sat on the platform here this morning. Ezekiel chapter 33, verses 31, 32, and 33. Sounds a little bit strange. And they come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. And lo, thou art unto them as a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear thy words, but they do them not. What kind of a voice do I have? Is it one that plays a sweet and lovely song? People hear the voice. They hear thy word, but they will not do it. How many have come to camp meeting and heard the preaching of the word? And you were back home doing something. You were taking care of something. You were preoccupied. You didn't, you just heard, that's all. You're not interested in doing what you have been told. Amen. That scripture really stirred my heart. You bring people in under the wrong spirit. We need to watch our altar services. We need to make sure that people pray through. It's not just a jabber, but it's the Holy Ghost moving. That sweet, wonderful gift of the Holy Ghost that moves in the depths of their heart. 
Hebrews chapter 12 will further substantiate what I'm talking about. And verse 5, Hebrews 12, 5 through 8. Ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Now, he's showing the difference between a true son and an illegitimate child. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. That's pretty plain, isn't it? What is a bastard? That's uh, the same mother, a different father. Right? That's a mother who will run around with anything. And that that she produces is not a true son. And the way you know that he's not a true son, he cannot be corrected. He cannot be chastised. You try to tell them what to do, they turn their nose up at you. They turn and walk the other way. What kind of a son are you? Were you born in that spirit of a meeting where there was that pure, sweet praise and worship to God and where the preacher, he may have been a humble man, he may not have had much of this world's goods, he may not have had much money, he didn't have much education, but he had a heart full of something that was being poured out and he wrung himself out and was reaching for souls and you were convicted of your sin and you felt tears flowing down your cheeks and you wanted to make your way to an old-fashioned altar and there you were born again in the right atmosphere in the right spirit under the right kind of preaching then people that are born that way you can correct them easily you don't have any trouble you can chasten them and they'll say pastor pour it on whatever it takes I'm willing to do what you want me to do. That's a true son if you please. But that old spirit that says I know as much about it as anybody else. I'll do what I want to do. These are changing times. You've got to get with it boy. Oh listen I can't go with that spirit. And we have some preachers I'm sorry to tell you that are minimizing preaching now. And they are making light of Bible teaching if you please. We don't need any Bible teaching any longer. I want you to know it's that teaching of the Word of God that makes us the kind of Christians that we ought to be. Praise God. That pure, sweet, straight preaching of the Word of God, that uncompromising gospel causes the seed to fall into the womb of the church and the Holy Ghost breathes upon it as people travail and sons and daughters are born and oh, what beautiful Christians they make. Can you say praise the Lord? Praise God. John 15 and 3 says, Now ye are clean by the word which I have spoken unto you. We're not only saved by the word, but we've got to have somebody to continue to preach the word to us so that we can stay cleansed and sanctified by it. Amen. Don't minimize preaching. I, I have thought many times of one of, of uh, your great Bible teachers of this country. Many of you are here today as a result of Brother Earl Jakes. His name will go down through the ages and uh, generations as a man who loved truth and a man who taught the Word of God. I only heard him two or three times, but I'll never forget those lessons that I heard him teach. That's the kind of teaching that has brought us to where we are. John 17, 17, Jesus said, Sanctify them through thy, say it, truth. Thy word is truth. And I want to turn right now and read Ephesians chapter 5. That old familiar scripture. We know what it's all about. Chapter 5. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it 
with the washing of water. How? By the word. Praise God. We are sanctified, kept, washed by the word of the Lord. We've got to have that good preaching and teaching that he might present to himself a glorious church, not having spot or blemish or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Thank God for the church. It has never been as important as it is in the hour in which we live. We'd better love the church. We'd better appreciate it. we better thank God for it. And so we are sanctified as we continue to walk in the truth. You deviate from truth, you're going to find yourself in trouble. Jeremiah 26 and 2 tells us, diminish not a word. Proverbs 30 and 6 tells us not to add anything to it. There's something about the word. Sometimes it looks rough. God made it that way. We'd like to diminish it a little bit. Uh, you know, smooth the edges off so that it wouldn't appear so rough. God meant for it to be that way. Don't diminish a word. Don't try to change the meaning of it one bit. And don't add anything to it. If you do, God says he would withhold his blessing. So as we continue to walk in the truth, Amen. We can have the favor of God. And the third point that I wanted to bring was our walk with him. We are not only saved and sanctified, we are satisfied daily as we walk in the truth. If you get off into error, there's going to be something about it that will trouble your spirit. Amen. The Bible tells us to walk in the light as he is in the light. And we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sins as we walk daily, as we live for him daily. Thank God. We walk in the light. Then there will be that constant cleansing that goes on. So we are satisfied as we walk in the truth. There's got to be a continual process go on. It's not a once and for all thing. Not eternal security. That's a convenient doctrine. It's without a foundation. Men rest the scriptures to their own destruction. That means they twist a scripture out of its setting and they twist another one out of its setting and they bring it together out of context and make a doctrine out of it. And my Bible tells me that I must walk in the light as he is in the light. That's the only way I can keep the blood of Jesus applied to my heart and my life. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, Ye are saved if, 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 if you keep in memory the things that have been preached unto you. You ought to thank God for that man who brought the gospel to you and preached to you. Praise God. You ought to thank God for that man who preached it straight to you. He did not compromise. He did not pat you on the back. This whole world is in trouble tonight, today, it's in trouble. Trouble everywhere you look, trouble in the land, trouble in the government, trouble uh, in nations. I read the paper this morning where there are African nations now almost at war against one another. You're going to hear more of that. Evil men and seducers waxing worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Perilous times upon us. For men are lovers of their own selves, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. You can't put your hope in a government. You can't put your hope in anything in this world. My friend, it's going to crumble. It's going to fade away. But I'm talking about something that's unchanging. I'm talking about something we can put our hope in this morning that will stand forever. Praise God. When the shaking takes place, there's going to be a church that rises out of all of it. And it's going to be victorious. And it's going to be strong. And it's going to be a church without spot or wrinkle or blemish or any such thing. It's going to be a holy church. Praise God. One of our elders stood at our general board meeting and he said he read in, in a national book several years ago 
where the leaders of the Church of China saw the communist takeover coming. They began to build something into their members, began to tell them the day is going to come when you won't have your churches. You'll not be permitted to worship. You'll not be able to preach the word. But you need to be prepared for it when it comes. And uh, they said those leaders built something within the Church of China that stood the storm. When they had to go underground, they became stronger, actually, than they were when they were permitted to go to church. There was something built within them that would stand the storm. When all the scaffolding was removed out of the way, everything that propped them up was gone. They had something that kept them. I looked at the expansion of your tabernacle. I know there must have been some large scaffolding in here at one time, and it was a necessary part of the building at that time. But there came a time when the scaffolding had to be torn down, even though it played a very important part in building the church. But that's the way it is with our lives. There is that time when the scaffolding is going to be torn down. Only he who now letteth will let until he's taken out of the way. And remember that wicked is going to be revealed. And if you can weaken and be shaken now, uh, listen friend, you're not going to stand the storm. But if something is built within you, loving the truth, saved by the truth, sanctified by the truth, living by the truth, then you're going to be able to stand the storm when it comes. And I read where a few, two or three years ago, they caught a young man in China who was carrying his Bible and witnessing, and they brought him to the public place. And on a certain day, he was going to be burned alive if he didn't uh, recant. And they tied him to a tree, and thousands of people came in to see it. And they doused uh, the tree and the limbs around his feet with, uh, with uh, gasoline. And they stood there with the torch in their hand. And they said, we're going to give you one last chance to give up this religion. If you don't, we're going to destroy you. He said, light the fire. I'm not afraid to die for what I believe in. Built to stand the storm. We better have it, folks. Have you got hold of something this morning that's going to help you in the time of persecution? I, I really do believe we're going to have some type of persecution. I don't know how it's going to come. We're not going to get, get off scot-free. I read a report the other day there are more uh, Christian martyrs in the 20th century than all the rest of the world put together. I don't know how they calculated that, but that's behind Iron Curtain countries, other parts of the world. We haven't noticed it very much, but I don't believe we're going to get off scot-free. I believe there's going to be some kind of persecution knocking our doors. I don't know how it's going to come, but I do believe it's going to come. But we better get hold of something that will put something within us that will help us to be built to stand the storm. I want that. That's what I'm talking about this morning. God help us to get hold of this thing. God help us to learn all over again the beautiful spirit of prayer, of travail. Hallelujah. That's what has made Pentecost what it is. And that's what's going to keep it going. I saw Brother Dudley walk across this platform last night, and you folks have taken him for granted. You're just used to him, that booming voice and his way of helping the preacher preach and all of that. But when he's gone, you're going to miss him. You don't realize how powerful that voice is now. Not many men have backbone enough that will stand in a pulpit and tell the young people what they can do and what they can't do. Thank God for men like that. I can remember those old timers that pointed their finger in our faces and told us that we could do certain things and some things we could not do, and we knew they meant it. Well, he's a voice. Someday he'll be missed walking across this platform. Someday he'll be missed helping the preacher preach. 
but he stood for something. You know that he stood for something, walking up and down the trails and going up and down the countryside, seeking out souls, uh, the hunger that he had in his heart to see the lost saved. Amen. Thank God for men like that. I was in a meeting a few years ago in Kilgore, Texas, and the caretaker of the cemetery there uh, sent word to our district superintendent, our presbyter, that uh, wondering if our conference would raise a little money to fill in some graves out in the old cemetery out in the country. There was one of our preachers and his wife that was buried there, been dead for many years. His family uh, had neglected the grave and the weeds had grown and graves had sunken in. And uh, it was old brother J.P. Stovall and his wife and uh, when they made the appeal to the conference, preachers were touched. Many began to pledge to give certain amounts. Finally, one old preacher stood up and he started weeping. He, he wept almost uncontrollably. And he said, I'll give $25, although I don't have it to give. He said, I'll give it. I must give it. He said, because this man brought the gospel to me and he preached to me and got my soul saved. And he said one night, I remember in the middle of the night, he knocked at my door and I went to the door and I didn't hardly recognize him. His clothes was torn on his body. His face was swollen. His eyes were almost closed. And uh, he was standing there trembling. And he said, Brother Gibson, can, can I come in? And, and can I stay with you a little bit? And he said, certainly. And then he told him the story. He'd been preaching in a little community down the way, and four men caught him after the service that night, told him they were going to kill him, carried him down the railroad track, beat him and beat him until he fell unconscious, and they thought he was dead. Finally, his spirit revived, and he made his way to Brother Gibson's house. He said, I watched him as he tried to lay down. He said, the only way that he could lay down was on his stomach. He had been beaten so bad in the back that he couldn't even lay on his back and said he would let, stretch out and lay down on his stomach and uh, said that went on for two or three days and he began to feel better. said then he got up and started walking the floor one day and said I knew that he was restless and finally he said well brother Gibson it's time for me to go now. He said well where are you going? He said well I feel a burden for those men that beat me. And I'm going to go back over there and preach some more. And I thought there a man gave his life, gave his body. Graves were sunken in now. No one was concerned now. But heaven knew where they were. Heaven took notice. Knew exactly where those graves were. Praise God. Thank God for men that have blazed the trail. And I looked at the young preachers on this platform last night, and I saw how moved they were by the preaching. And I thought, you know, as long as we have young men who are concerned enough about truth, that they are willing to wring their eyes out with tears, and they're willing to get down on the floor and get their clothes all messed up, we're still safe. We're still safe. Because I can remember preaching like Brother Urson preached last night when I was just beginning to feel the call to preach. And I was, it seemed like the word would just wring my heart out. And I'd want to crawl to get to the altar. I'd think, oh, if I can just get down to that altar and pray. And I'd stay there, other young preachers there. And then I saw these young preachers last night. As long as we can find young men who will yield themselves to God and have strong convictions and are willing to pray like that, then this church is going to go forward. It's going to be in good hands. Praise God. Hallelujah. Let's worship the Lord a little bit. Bless his wonderful name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. Would you close your eyes and sing it? The emblem of suffering and shame. Love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost Sunset and the polar star have lighted o'er thy transit head. Thy path has led o'er land and sea, but hast thou been to Calvary? There comes that time in our lives we have to go back and see where it all started the sacrifice that was made, the blood that was shed, and cling to the old rugged cross. The cross makes the difference. God bless you. I preached and taught these three days on messages that I felt God definitely spoke to my heart about. I did not come to this meeting planning to preach anything. I had no message in mind. I came with an open heart. And I feel like that God wants us to love his truth more than anything else in this world. God bless you. Let us stand.